Once again, coming out of COP, we've seen big new headlines. The problem is that history tells us that today's big headlines often end up as tomorrow's broken promises. If we're going to meet the 1.5 degree target, we need deep, sustained and immediate reductions in emissions. And we haven't got those at the moment. The commitments made by countries, let alone the implementation of those commitments, is lagging far behind. Now, going into COP27, a lot of the stuff had already been done in Glasgow, the huge amount of stuff, you know, that was a COP that covered two years in effect. And, and so what, what we expected out of this was much more on the agenda of the developing countries with an African focus. It was going to be around resilience, adaptation, finance. And, and we saw that, and we got some really good outcomes in terms of the loss and damage. We got an adaptation fund, an early warning system. Um, this, this is all great, but what we haven't seen is the scaling up of ambition on mitigation, which is needed from the big emitters to get us to that 1.5 target. There's a growing body of research that shows that the consequences of climate change are already affecting a large number of communities worldwide and are going to continue to do so unless we take drastic action. The latest UNEP emissions gap report show us that the policies currently in place put us on track for 2.8 degrees of warming by the end of the century. I don't think we're getting the messaging quite right on social media. So for example, there's a lot of polarization, which we know harms public support. So there's stories about leaders arriving in private jets, about the amount of lobbyists from the fossil fuel industry, which are important narratives, but they're distracting us from the real issue, which is that we need systematic level agreements on how to reduce international emissions. The Centre for Climate Engagement has been working on a project where we've been looking at over 20 areas of UK regulation to see how we can use existing regulation to drive climate action as we wait for new policy and frameworks to come along. We'll be working with the boards in our community, particularly those in the UK through Chapter Zero, to really inform boardrooms into how we can use regulations that are there now, how they can engage with their general counsel, in-house lawyers and the private law firms that they're working for to use all areas of regulation, contract, planning, employment, etc. We need to be able to use all areas of the law to drive this climate agenda. The field of green finance is suffering from a severe lack of scientific credibility. In order to make green finance really work for profit and for the planet, we have to reinvent it on a rigorous core foundation of scientific understanding. We must provide the evidence base behind green bonds and green exchange funds to ensure that the claims made actually bear out in environmental improvements on the ground. So after COP27, what needs to happen are that you know, governments need to redouble their efforts, setting policies and, and intermediate goals that really are ambitious and aligned with the Paris Agreement. We need to see the, the, the finance industry and, and uh, business really get behind this agenda to, to think about their risks, their future business opportunities and, and the disclosure requirements. And we need to see um, you know, far more international coordination and support for transitions in developing countries like South Africa, like Indonesia, where we've just seen these uh, Just Energy Transition Partnerships announced. My message to the UK government is to stop wasting time. Higher energy prices only increase the urgency and the return on investments to reduce our dependence on foreign sources of energy. 